Tonight on Panorama, we meet the families bringing up some of Britain's most vulnerable children. When he was first born, they gave him 24 hours. No one knew Charlie was born, like friends and other family, until like a week later, because we just didn't know how to describe him. And we wanted to be protective as well. Alfie Evans and Charlie Gard were severe cases, too ill to survive. But more babies with serious medical problems do now survive. Are we willing, though, to give them a decent quality of life? Many families have said to me that they feel more and more they're fighting for their child. They're fighting for the health assessments. They're fighting for equipment. Three extraordinary families let Panorama into their lives to show us the battles they fight and what it takes to give their children the care they need or simply to keep them alive. Happy birthday, dear Logan. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> yeah. nice. I didn't, in all honesty, think we would reach for. Are you going to have some? That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When he was first born, they gave him 24 hours. Do you want me to take the pound of uh, cake? <laughs> Go weightlifting with it. What's your puffer got? Can you feel it? Is it going to help open it? Logan lives with his three older siblings and his mum, a full-time carer, and dad, an ambulance driver. It says to Logan, have a very special day. Lots of love from Batman. Hashtag Hayden. <coughs> he's due a nebulizer and he's due his meds. Logan has cerebral palsy and extensive brain damage. He is visually impaired but is thought to be able to see the colours red and blue and enjoy bright lights. No, let me have your tube, you little monkey. He is given drugs via a tube into his stomach up to four times a day, which include treatment for nerve pain and occasionally diazepam too. He come out of hospital at 11 weeks old and it was then when we sat down with doctors to discuss the long-term things for Logan and it was brought up then that actually he falls into life-limiting category but all they will tell us is they don't expect him to live out his childhood. How old they say childhood is, we don't know. If he sleeps, does all this stop? No, he hasn't slept. He doesn't fully sleep. Logan was hospitalised 11 times last year due to painful muscle spasms known as dystonic attacks. A severe attack can affect the muscles used to breathe and swallow. The only way I can describe it from what I see him doing is as if you were to go to the gym non-stop for 24 hours a day for a week. Then you might sort of feel how he's feeling because there's no sleep in between, there's no nothing. His muscles work continuously. So when he has the really bad episodes, it is that whole thing of, is this it? I'm going to dish up dinner. When Logan is hospitalised, the family can struggle financially if Tony has to take time off work, losing pay in the process. Don't. Tea gum. Oh, 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 oh. He's having stew like the rest of them. I just blend it down so it's not as lumpy. The group that we take Logan to up at the Woodside Centre, the local Lidl's donate their food that's just about out of it so they couldn't sell it in the shop. They donate it up there so we can then have whatever we need. So it makes a big difference when I've got this lot to feed. There are just over a million children with some form of disability in the UK. Logan is at the extreme end of a growing number with complex needs recently estimated at 118,000. 
so I stop feeding. We know that the numbers are rising. That's because the children are living longer with these conditions. The medical advancements, the technologies, the equipment has really rapidly grown. And in addition to that, I think that we have changed in the way we think about these children and their expectations of quality of life. It is heavy. Yeah. Professor Code, who has been researching the lives of children with complex needs for over 20 years, has come to meet Jordan, who cares for her son, Charlie. So you have all these appointments here. Is this, is this a sort of six months or a month? Yeah. What period of time is that? Uh, May, May, this is just May. Is that a normal month that you have that many appointments? Fortunately. Yeah. I wish it wasn't. And how many consultants do you see? 25. Charlie, who is nearly three, has a rare Cat 6B gene disorder and is missing part of his brain. He can't walk or talk but seems to respond to his family around him. He is fed through a tube into his stomach. You've lots to say, haven't you? Charlie was born via emergency caesarean at 36 weeks, after which he was immediately whisked away. I remember the specialist coming in and she said that... She said there was so much wrong with Charlie, we didn't even know if he was a girl or a boy. And I was heartbroken. And other people just coming in, holding your hand, and I was just like... What did you do with that? Six hours later, I got to see Charlie. He was so tiny. And even I could see there was stuff wrong with him. It's not what you pictured. Because in your head, you've... You, planned his whole future. I didn't know what to do. So intense at the start and, yeah. you know, everything was full throttle. We, 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 we didn't know where he was going, did we? They didn't know what syndrome he had. They were just saying that he has characteristics of this syndrome, he has characteristics of his other syndrome, but there was none that actually said this is Charlie's. Ashley, Charlie's dad, is an HGV driver. He and Jordan are getting married later this year. So I'm just doing Charlie's Tracky Tuesday change. For the first couple years of his life, Charlie had to breathe through a tracheotomy, this tube going into his throat. One, two, three. And that's that done for another week. <laughs> but several weeks ago, that all changed when Charlie's doctors removed the tube, believing he would now be able to breathe unaided. Move leg and stride. Without this tube, the state no longer classifies Charlie as being life-threatened, and his health care funding is being withdrawn. They've taken away all the hours. So from going from, like, 27 hours to just nothing. I get their decision. I don't agree with their decision. It's hard enough trying to get help. You have to fit so many criteria as well, which you're there going, but you, actually, I think you're, my child fits into this category, and they're there going, well, no, actually, they don't, because technically they're two, and they don't actually do anything less or more than an average two-year-old. How do you think Charlie's needs to from an average two-year-old? Charlie can't walk. He can't sit. He can't tell me. He can't eat. He depends on me to do everything. Clever. It was Charlie's gran, Annette, who gave up her job and trained to become Charlie's qualified carer. When the funding ends, she will need to leave and find another job. <gasps> you are so clever. How are you going to feel in eight weeks when you have to just... Oh, I don't want to think about it at the moment. We'll just get on with it. Uh, 
he's not out of my life, is he? He's, he's still in it a lot. He needs help, and so does Jordan. So I hope she gets it somewhere else. And that's one thing I do worry. She doesn't see a lot of people. But Charlie still has to be fed through a tube into his stomach. Put it out. Give the area a bit of a wipe. Push the new button in. And yeah. The challenges faced by Charlie's family reflect a growing funding crisis. Figures given to Panorama reveal that an estimated £1.1 billion extra is required by the NHS to keep up with the demand for services such as outpatient appointments and emergency visits for children with disabilities. It presents us with a massive dilemma about how we structure our service provision um, for children when we do have more children living with complex needs. It has to be part of the discussion that we start to have as a society about where the responsibility lies, where the funding lies. That's where the discussion should be, not about trying to save a life at the point that that child is born or becomes unwell, but actually thinking about, OK, that's brilliant, we can do that, but what do we need to put in place then to support families? Logan and his family regularly visit their local day centre for deaf-blind children. All right. I'm hurting again. There's more and more need out there. We're working with a lot more families who were told that their children wouldn't survive as long as they have, and now teenagers when they weren't expected to make sort of uh, into school. We have to pick up the, the slack, as it were, from where the statutory services are, are, are being able to provide less. Although the family gets some benefits, due in part to Logan's needs, they largely depend on Tony's salary. So it is a case of he's in hospital, Tony then has to have time off, and when you're talking half a month, like it was at Christmas, and you've still got the rent to pay, council tax to pay, as well as stress of how are we going to manage those bills while he's in in that situation. It just doesn't help because there is nothing to give us that extra all right, help. To get anything has been a struggle. He's not feeling very well at the moment. If he doesn't calm himself down, he starts with his dystonia. If we can't manage it to start with, then it just gets worse, and that's why we end up in hospital a lot. Over the course of the next few hours, Logan's condition worsens, a situation the family has seen too often before. This one here that he's having at the moment is the diazepam to help relax him. Basically, it's one of his rescue meds to help him to just try and calm down. But we're waiting for the consultants to phone us back again to see whether or not we can increase the, one of the other ones to see if that will help. We will to increase it up to the five. No problem. Yeah, no worries. OK, thank you very much. Bye. We've got to increase it, back then up to five for the weekend. Call for help if he is no better, but phone Monday to review to see what, to whether or not he stays up or has to go in. Over the weekend, Logan's condition deteriorates. When he starts having problems with his breathing, he's rushed into hospital. When this last happened at Christmas, doctors struggled to maintain his oxygen levels in order to keep him alive. By the end of last year, it got to the point that I'd had enough. Being quite good this year that this is the first time we've been admitted in. I can't take the pain away. I can't do anything to help him. 
and when he's struggling, it's not like I can even pick him up and cuddle him because that doesn't help because he's in so much pain and so stiff. Later, the family come to visit. It's on my lap. I'm too big to do this now. Right. You are getting a little bit big to doing this. Uh, mummy? Yes. I said about bringing Bunny. Dad was only going to bring that one, but I said that one. Mm -hmm. He's too tired to kind of take notice what's going on at the moment. Like many children with complex needs, Logan was born prematurely. Medical advances mean growing numbers of very premature babies are surviving, even at 24 weeks. But despite improvements in survival rates, a proportion will have significant health needs. This seems to suggest that we have two different groups of babies in terms of prognosis. And the difficulty is in not knowing at the point that you resuscitate a 24-week baby which group that that baby will fall into. Come on then. Oh. Hello. Hello, darling. Do you want some bottle? I've made the amount to give the medication with. Amelia was born prematurely at 24 weeks and has spent the first few months of her life in hospital. This is um, breast milk with her medication in. There are concerns linked to the lump on her head. She's getting more of these hemangiomas. They're, sort of, they're, they're called birthmarks, but they keep more keep appearing. So that I think the worry is that they can come more internally, which can have an impact. Daddy's going to take the credit for my winding now. All that effort. Amelia also had excess fluid in her brain, so a shunt has been fitted to allow this to drain, halting the build-up of pressure. Today we are going home. So she's four months old yesterday. She would be 11 days old past her due date today. That was me that the family that. is hopeful that Amelia will be one of the six out of ten babies born this early who will live a life with mild or no ongoing health needs. Hello. Oh, she's just so much more alert. Oh, it's just so you. nice to see. Hello. Hello. Hey, guys. Oh, hi, Doctor. Right, so the moment is here. Yay, yes. finally. Um, so this is Amelia's discharge summary. Fab. You have a follow-up appointment with me in uh, four to six weeks. Yeah. Great Ormond Street Neurosurgery. Yes. And then for the birthmark clinic for the yeah. hemangioma. Yeah. Physiotherapy. Yeah, it's lovely. And you've got a blood test appointment in two weeks' time. <laughs> Lots of just appointments. Just a few appointments. <laughs> Good Goodbye. Girl. Good girl. We'll see you in a few weeks' she's, time. She's milk drunk. See yeah. you in a few weeks. Say so thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Right. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Right. Oh, that's it. We're constantly monitoring head circumference. Yeah. And there's the pressure building up again because that can stop brain development. And obviously, this is my key stress and worry. Thank you, darling. Gonna miss you, God. I think she's gonna do amazing. I miss you so much. Oh, we don't cry. It's happy tears. But there's obviously always the worry in the back of my mind that something's not gonna develop normally, that things are gonna start going wrong for her. So I'm just staying really positive at the moment. This is outside, Amelia. She's <laughs> She's still excited, I can tell. The family are on their way home to see Amari, Amelia's big brother. We need to sort the Moses basket because she needs something to lie in. Up, 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 up. At two and a half, Amari's family aren't too sure how much he can see or understand as he's visually impaired and has some brain damage. Amari, who's that in there? Oh, that was clever looking, but look, who's this? That's your sister. It moves and everything. And he's got enough appointments of his own, let alone her added appointments. Oh, no. Mari. It's OK for this moment. <laughs> it's fine. Give me when I need to go to the toilet or 
do something and Amelia starts crying or Amari starts crying or I start crying. <laughs> Amari is my special little boy. He's very funny. He's really cheeky. He's he's very determined and stubborn as well. He's he's a lovely little boy. He's got a lot of very complex medical needs. But it doesn't hinder his personality. He's got the most amazing personality. Up, 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 up. Amari also has cerebral palsy, which makes his muscles stiff and tense. So Claire needs to stretch him intensively several times a day. It's tough as she has MS. And the more worked up he gets, the stiffer he gets. So the harder it is to do anything. OK, we'll do it together. I know that these things work. They're time consuming and they're hard and you feel bad if you don't do them, if you miss a day. Stretch arms, go. The thing is, it's getting harder and harder for me to do these things with him as well, because he's just getting so heavy. Push, yes. For families like Claire's, state-funded short breaks, or respite, have traditionally been provided to give the child a safe break and the parents time to recharge. Short breaks and respite are the backbone for many of these families. It gives them a night off, a few hours off. Even getting a babysitter is really, really hard for them. So having a respite, having a break is vital to many of them. Do you want to go out? <coughs> yes. We're going to Nascot Lawn today, so... Amari will hopefully stay there for an hour, <laughs> minimum, hopefully. Nascot Lawn is their local respite centre. I'm, I'm entitled to more. Amari is entitled to several hours of care each week. But staff shortages and threatened funding cuts mean that, in reality, his time has been shortened. To an hour, yeah. What can you do in an hour? Not very much. <laughs> I, normally I've got something to do in town. It used to be much easier to do when it was just me and I could run in, but obviously now there's an extra one, so this hour now would take longer. It would take me much longer to do anything now than it would have done just me. My little bit of sanity in the day, once a week for an hour. Right, I need to find her hat, which is there. Oh, brilliant. She cries quite a lot, but he used to cry a lot. It's just babies, I think. But obviously I'm paranoid that it's pressure in her head or that it's something else. Hello. That's your brother, he's loud, isn't he? <laughs> Local families have fought hard to keep it open, but Claire's respite centre, Nascot Lawn, may well eventually close due to a removal of funding. We have discovered respite services being reduced across the country. Panorama sent freedom of information requests to all the local authorities in England. Of the 84 who responded to the question, nearly half reported a reduction in respite funding since 2014. Looking ahead, of the 77 who could provide this information, 39% said there would be further cuts in respite funding. This is just one element of an increasing funding gap for disabled children. It's been estimated that councils need £433 million more a year just to meet the social care needs of this group. There will be difficult decisions to make because we have finite pots of money and it might be that if we spend more on children we spend less on an adult service but that discussion absolutely needs to be had many of the families have said to me that they feel more and more they're fighting for their child that they're fighting for the health assessments they're fighting for equipment they're fighting for a caregiver 
However, the Department of Education is increasing its schools and high needs budget by £1.3 billion to 2020, and the Prime Minister's extra £20 billion for the NHS may also help disabled children, as a priority area is children's mental health services. Look, Daddy getting a cuddle. But for now, Charlie's healthcare funding is coming to an end. Today is the last day that I actually officially, well, that I work for Jordan. A continuing care contract is now ended. Super cool. So next week I'm officially unemployed. <laughs> My best friends, best friends. It's going to be like the times when he's really, really poorly. Or when she's got a long journey in front of her for an appointment and she's not going to have the help or the support at all. None. And, and... Come on. It's going to be hard. And that's not fair. She needs more help. I'm gonna miss it, I really am. Yeah. How can you not miss this little face? If I could change him, I don't know. Because he's perfect the way he is. He really is. He's lovely. They're all a gift, no matter what. <laughs> Today's day 12. Yeah, day 12. Logan is still in hospital. Philippa hopes he can leave soon, but this will undoubtedly mean a step up in his care at home to include a machine to supply him with the correct dose of oxygen overnight. And what is your biggest fear? Uh, um... That's our biggest fear. Uh, Probably not being a time when we can... Yeah. Cope with it. And when we have to make the decision on what's next done for him, if there is anything that can be done for him, or we have to say, right... Enough's enough. Enough's enough. And that's probably the hardest part of it. Have you, have you thought about that? <laughs> no, I'm not going to. Because that's too hard. We just look at what we've got, the days we've got with him, and do what we can to make those days enjoyable for what he can enjoy and help him as much as we can and <clears throat> for the others as well, so they, they've got the memories. For details of organisations which offer advice and support, go online to the BBC Action Line website. Be moved by the magic of the BBC Proms. Listen to every prom live on BBC Radio 3. With every prom also available on the BBC iPlayer radio app, you won't have to miss a single note. Go to bbc.co.uk slash proms to find out more. Coming up at 10, US President Donald Trump sides with Russia against the FBI as he meets President Putin in Helsinki. Theresa May caves into...